I'm Professor Mark Rabowski, and this lecture will cover online defamation, or making false statements about someone that seriously harms their reputation. Whether conveying simple, straightforward information, or urging others to action, words matter deeply. And when used carelessly, words can cause harm, despite what the famous nursery rhyme says. It's important to understand online defamation because it can have serious consequences. You can be sued for millions of dollars if you do it. Online defamation is a topic that many students find complicated. While the law can get complicated for lawyers and judges trying to sort out the details after a defamation lawsuit is filed, the basic idea of defamation, which is enough for the average internet user to protect themselves from most lawsuits, is fairly straightforward. So what is defamation? Here is a definition. It is the broadcasting or publication of a false statement of fact that seriously harms someone's reputation. Online defamation is also sometimes called slander or libel. It can occur online or offline. Here's an example of online defamation. If you post a tweet that says, Professor Johnson stole a school bus and used it for a family vacation this summer, you'd better be right. If you're wrong, you have probably seriously harmed defamed Professor Johnson's reputation. Not too hard to understand, right? But we need to dig a bit deeper. Within this one-line definition are five things that the person suing, in this example Professor Johnson, must show before he can successfully sue for defamation. And the Supreme Court added one more. Let's take a quick look at each of them. The first thing the person suing must show is that the defamatory statement has been published. That's usually pretty straightforward. It is important to understand, however, that a broadcasted or published statement can occur almost anywhere online. Newspaper websites and blogs are common sources of defamation, but defamatory statements can also appear in tweets, Yelp reviews, YouTube videos, podcasts, wikis, online discussion boards, and elsewhere. In addition to showing that the statement was broadcasted or published, a person suing must also show that he or she has been individually identified. In many cases, this is also pretty easy to determine. If a person is named, he or she will almost certainly meet the identification requirement. In other cases, it's not so clear. If you do not explicitly name the person, but provide enough specific details that there can be no confusion over whom you're referring to, the identification standard is met. So if you defame the government executive who makes his home at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, it is still reasonably identifiable as the president. If there is no identification, a person cannot successfully sue for defamation, even if he or she believes that they are the one targeted by a false accusation. Back to the third part of the definition of defamation, and it's very clear. Only false statements of fact can be defamatory. There aren't too many black and white rules in the law, but this is one of them. Truth is an absolute defense to a charge of defamation. Even though you might know that Professor Johnson took a bus without permission and used it for a family vacation, though, do you have sufficient reliable evidence, for example, verifiable documents, police reports, photographs, trustworthy unbiased witnesses, etc., to back your claim if Professor Johnson denies it. If you don't, you may not be able to rely on the truth to get you out of a defamation jam. On the other hand, if you know something is true and you can prove it, you can never be successfully sued for online defamation no matter how much it might damage a person's reputation or how angry they might be. As the saying goes, a person is entitled to no greater reputation than they have earned. Next, the suing person must show that the defamatory statement is an assertion of fact, not an opinion. If a statement contains only opinion, it cannot be defamatory. Unfortunately, it is sometimes difficult to tell one from the other. In our example involving Professor Johnson, 
it is easy to tell that the statement is an assertion of fact. For one thing, facts are objective. They are either true or false. Either he unlawfully took the bus or he didn't. If instead you had simply said, Professor Johnson is horrible, the statement, which can't really be proven true or false, would be pure opinion and protected in a defamation lawsuit. Incidentally, this is one of the reasons why cyberbullying and internet trolling is so difficult to regulate. Most cyberbullying amounts to name-calling, statements like Johnny is fat, Pedro is ugly, or Rina is dumb. Although they are mean and they can seriously harm someone's feelings, they are not defamatory. Some statements contain both opinion and fact. For example, if you say, I think Professor Johnson is awful because he misused school property this summer, that's a mixed statement that might support a defamation claim. And be careful, simply prefacing a statement with, in my opinion, will not protect you from a defamation claim if it contains untrue factual assertions. A close cousin of opinion is satire and humor. The publication of April Fool's emails, spoof articles on websites like The Onion, and other humorous or satirical online content occasionally prompts threats of defamation or other lawsuits by individuals who find themselves the target of ridicule. Generally, it's not a defense to defamation to claim that you were just trying to be funny or meant it only as a joke. Humor is not necessarily the same as opinion and does not enjoy blanket protection from lawsuits. However, if a statement cannot reasonably be interpreted by readers to be one of express or implied fact, it cannot be defamatory. In other words, as long as readers understand that a joke or a cartoon is not meant to be taken seriously, its subject cannot successfully sue for defamation. Subtle humor can be dangerous, though. For example, posting a photo to Instagram of a coach and an athlete and writing a joking comment that the two are having an affair might be funny to those who know it's a joke, but it might also be fairly believable to those who don't and possibly harm reputations. So to be safe, if you intend something as a joke, be sure that everyone will recognize it as such. Next up, in order to successfully sue for online defamation, the person suing must also show that the false statement about them caused serious harm to their reputation. Being mildly offended or embarrassed is not enough. Some statements about a person, if false, will almost always be sufficiently harmful to a person's reputation to support a defamation claim. For example, if you publish a statement that accuses a person of having committed a crime, such as stealing a school bus, your facts must be accurate because such accusations will almost always seriously harm a person's reputation. On the other hand, if you tweet that Professor Johnson gave you a dirty look in class today, he can't sue you for de defamation even if you're lying. Once it's shown that a statement has been published, identifies a specific individual, is false, asserts a fact, and causes serious harm to a reputation, the person claiming defamation must still show one more thing when suing in an American court. The Supreme Court has said that in order to successfully sue for defamation, the First Amendment requires that the person suing must also show, at a minimum, that the defendant messed up, that he or she was somehow at fault. In other words, before you can be successfully sued, you must have done something a reasonable person would not have done or failed to do something that a reasonable person should have done. When writing online about public officials or public figures, the person who claims he has been defamed may even have to show that you knew what you wrote was false or that you acted with reckless disregard for the truth. This is what the United States Supreme Court referred to in the 1964 case New York Times v. Sullivan as actual malice. This is why tabloids and gossip websites are able to avoid many lawsuits. The growth of social media raises new and interesting questions about who's a public figure. For example, if you have 20,000 followers on Twitter, does that make you a public figure? 
What if you post a YouTube video that goes viral and gets a million views? Are you then a public figure? People aren't the only ones who can be defamed. Business defamation, also known as business disparagement, is another potential pitfall relating to online speech. It involves belittling someone's business, goods, or services with a remark that is false or misleading, but not necessarily defamatory. To succeed in a business disparagement case, the plaintiff must prove that, first, the defendant made the disparaging remark, second, the defendant either intended to injure the business, knew the statement was false, or recklessly disregarded whether it was true, and third, the statement resulted in special damages to the plaintiff. It is very difficult for businesses to win such cases, though, because the actual malice requirement is so high. Courts will only impose liability for business disparagement stemming from online communications in the most egregious cases. Sometimes businesses will threaten frivolous defamation lawsuits as a way to censor criticism, even if it's valid criticism. The business knows it has no chance of winning the lawsuit, but merely wants to intimidate customers, rivals, and others from expressing negative opinions about the business. This practice is known as a strategic lawsuit against public participation, or SLAP. In response, some states have passed anti-SLAP laws to fight such abuses. But it still remains a problem. After all, what person wants to deal with the headache of an expensive lawsuit? Web 2.0 and its interactivity raises a new interesting legal issue for online defamation. Can you get sued for defamation comments that people post on your site? The short answer is no. If you operate a blog, discussion board, social media platform, or website that allows users to comment, you are not legally responsible for defamatory comments made by outsiders. The Federal Communications Decency Act should shield you and your website though the authors of such comments can and do get sued. The reason for this is Congress did not want to stifle web development by placing an enormous burden on website owners to screen every comment for defamation. Without such a law, massive online discussion boards such as Reddit would likely not be possible. You can retain legal immunity even if you voluntarily screen profane or defamatory comments. But if you start rewriting comments to improve them, then you may become responsible as a co-creator. Or if you write your own blog post that quotes someone else making a defamatory statement, you could land in legal hot water just the same as if you had said or written the defamatory statement yourself. Finally, if you make a defamatory comment online, don't assume you can hide behind anonymity. A court may compel a website to reveal which IP address the defamatory statement came from, and based on that cyberspace address, they may be able to determine your in real life identity. On the other hand, if you operate a website and the police or someone else wants to know who posted comments on your site, you don't need to reveal anything unless they get a court order or a subpoena. Well, that's it. Hopefully now you feel a little more confident in being able to recognize and safely navigate some of the most common defamation traps for the internet. This has been Professor Grabowski. Thanks for watching.